Around 44 AD, the inhabitants of Colchester witnessed something that blew their minds. Elephants at the head of columns of faceless soldiers, wrapped around in armor and bristling with weapons. Leading this parade was a man in a grand and elaborate costume. He was the Emperor Claudius, a stammerer, a cripple, but more importantly, ruler world's first superpower, Rome. Claudius wanted an emphatic and unforgettable way of impressing on his new subjects, the people of southern Britain, just what kind of a ruler they were dealing with. This was Rome, the showman, the myth-maker at work. An elephant was part exotic novelty, part weapon of mass destruction. By choosing to make his entrance on one, Claudius was driving home his message. Oppose us and we will crush you. Join us and we will show you a whole new world. The Romans were here and the Third Age of Britain had begun. It would last from 43 to 410 AD. They forced the people of this island to rise above local loyalties of family, tribe and race. The Romans found dozens of warring clans here and left them with the idea that is Britain. Claudius wasn't the first Roman ruler to visit Britain. A hundred years before him, Julius Caesar had led a tentative and unsuccessful mission here. Caesar found Britain a fertile land, an Iron Age El Dorado, inhabited by expert farmers, who lived hill forts and well-established villages. But Caesar also thought Britain a bizarre place, where druids practiced human sacrifice, and where people seemed alien and exotic. All the Britons dye themselves with woad. They wear their hair long and shave all their bodies, with the exception of their heads and upper lips. Wives are shared between groups of 10 or 12 men, especially between brothers and between fathers and sons. This description is a turning point. It's the earliest written account of Britain. Caesar's recent conquest of France had exhausted him and his army. He only stayed a few weeks on these islands. But the people of Britain now and or wouldn't ignore the mighty empire whose frontier was just the other side of the channel. In the century between Julius Caesar's raid in 54 BC and Claudius's invasion in 43 AD, the archaeological evidence suggests that clan leaders in southern Britain grew ever more impressed by Rome's power and her consumer goods. If you'd walked into a British clan leader's house at this time, you'd have been struck by an ostentatious display of all things Roman. British chieftains were trading slaves and hunting dogs in return for wine, olive oil, textiles, jewels and three. Owning something like an amphora of wine or exotic beads was a visible sign that you'd reached the top of the pile. The reason much of this evidence survives is that objects of desire were used to line the burials of powerful men. The mere fact that Roman artefacts are being chosen to accompany people on that most important journey to the afterlife shows just what kind of an impression the Roman world was already making on Iron Age Britain. You've got many of the local kings allying themselves to the Romans, and they would have used this sort of friendship with Rome uh, to vie with their neighbours a bit. So showing how Roman some of them were would have been a way of showing their power. And some of them actually chose Roman coins to model their own coins on. So they were trying to become more and more Romanized. Some clan leaders even sent their children to Rome to be educated. Emotional ties and familiarity grew alongside trade links. This presented an ideal opportunity to the new emperor, Claudius. Regarded as weak in the vicious world of Roman politics, 
He desperately needed to stamp his authority. Extending the empire would look impressive, and with southeastern Britain already Romanized, it was a soft target. So in 43 AD, a Roman army, 40,000 strong, landed on the south coast. But there was no battle. Instead of taking over by force, they installed a Romanized Briton as king of the local tribe. He was known by his Latin name, Togi Dubnus. My guess is that um, he was a member of the Atrobatic tribe here, and at some stage that he went off to Rome and was probably brought up as a Roman. And then when the invasion came in AD 43, he was probably brought over and put into power here. This bust could well be Togi Dubnus as a child. Its quality makes it fit for a king, and it was found where he lived. As a grown man, Togi Dubnus was immortalised by the Roman historian Tacitus. Tacitus wrote the only detailed account of Roman Britain, much of it based on talking to his father, who was governor of Britain 40 years after the invasion. Tacitus understood that Togi Dubnus was a puppet and that the Romans pulled his strings. A number of the British tribes were given to Togi Dubnus as king. This was in accordance with the long accepted Roman policy. And here Tacitus inserts one of his sardonic asides. Ut haberet instrumenta servitutis et reges, of making even kings instruments for the imposition of servitude. He was a client king, he was put in power and kept in power by the Romans, he was able to rule on behalf of the Romans, and um, one of the classical writers actually says estates were given to Togidubnus, who remained faithful for a very long time. In return for his services, archaeologists believe the Romans built Togidubnus an enormous palace near Fishbourne in Sussex. At the time, it was the largest Roman palace north of the Alps. The people of Britain were used to villages of small roundhouses. Now in their midst was a construction whose size and shape was entirely alien. Previously, going to see one's chief meant entering a slightly bigger roundhouse than your own. Now you had to walk past 150 yards of exquisitely manicured hedges and grand colonnades. Everything here reeks of the brave new Romano world of post-conquest Britain. It's a high-tech superhouse, a show home that loudly advertises the benefits of Roman rule. There isn't a whiff of British culture here. Unlike all those Iron Age roundhouses, this place is rectangular and it's packed to the gills with Roman technology and Roman art. Fishbourne is more than just a palace. It's one world declaring its superiority over another. It really is the architecture of power. So the whole thing is contrived to make you feel small. That would have been a shot. So too, I think, would have been colour. And here you have a whole range of bright colours. There were bright reds, bright yellows, bright greens, painting large areas of wall. There were vast coloured mosaics everywhere. The whole thing would have been an incredible shot. The occupants of Fishbourne aped Roman design and decoration, even when it was ludicrously inappropriate. Large rooms, airy colonnades, ceramic tiles, all made perfect sense in warmer climes, but here was simply foolish. This would have been wonderful somewhere in Italy. It's a bit chilly in Britain. So they had to have braziers in these rooms, and you can actually see down here where the white tessery are discoloured. And that's presumably where they had a brazier. So imagine them moving the brazier around and huddling around the brazier on a cold winter evening. In terms of area, the impact of a palace like Fishbourne um, went right down to the lowliest peasant. Some were press ganged into building it, and they undoubtedly saw Romans as brutal oppressors. But many locals also learned new, marketable skills like bricklaying, stonemasonry, and surveying. It gave a whole range of opportunities for young people to learn. And Tacitus says that the Britons are wonderful students. They love learning. You're trained in skills you didn't even know existed. And then when you had them, 
uh, then you could go out and use those skills in building other Roman villas or going across this town and joining in with a building project there. So it was a very rapid uh, learning process that people were going through. And a place like Fishbourne is in lots of ways um, a means of Romanization. The southeast may have fallen without a fight, but elsewhere, Britons would engage with the brutal force of Rome's army, the most efficient military machine in antiquity. Within a year of Claudius's invasion, most of southeastern Britain was under Roman control. But further west, in modern-day Dorset and Devon, was the territory of the Durotriges, a tribe still hostile to Rome. Their people would have heard of the arrival of this massive foreign army in the east, and by early AD 44, would even have suffered occasional Roman cavalry patrols, raiding their lands, gathering intelligence, and demanding food and supplies. Here at Hod Hill in Dorset, this enormous hill fort was the power base of the Durotriges. Inside the massive earthworks were dozens of roundhouses, the homes of this large, stable farming community. Archaeologists believe that it was here that Durotriges made their stand against the Romans. Massed up here, guarding the ramparts, was a tribal militia. These were men who'd been steeped in the warrior ethic since birth. They'd gone through their pre-battle rituals and now they were ready to fight to the death to defend their land. They had the advantage of a fantastic natural defensive position and a reputation as a race who had no fear of death. And yet here at Hod Hill and at encounters throughout the country, it's not the Britons, but the Romans who win. The men of the Durotriges weren't full-time soldiers. They fought out of loyalty when summoned by their clan leader. They were keen to demonstrate their fearlessness and show off their blue body paint. This meant many fought bare-chested, even though armor was available to them. In fact, this vanity and posturing was a real hindrance to British military effectiveness. They bleached their hair with lime and made it stand on end. One writer said the spikes were so stiff that you could stick an apple on the end of each point. Unfortunately, this prevented them wearing life-saving helmets. The Roman attitude to warfare was entirely alien to the Britons, who were used to modest skirmishes. In contrast, the Romans were experts in tactics and large-scale warfare. The secret is certainly partly in discipline and in organisation and logistics, in supplying troops. The Romans treated warfare as a, a very complex science and almost a business. It's something that they ran on a very large scale. Taking Hod Hill would be no pushover. It was steep, and if you made it to the top, there were 40-foot ramparts and deep ditches. The Roman force would need iron discipline and the latest military technology. Well, we have some quite specific evidence as to how the Romans assaulted it. Just to the interior here, we have the foundations of the roundhouses of the inhabitants. And one in particular, just up there, had about 11 iron bolt heads from catapult bolts, which had been shot in over the rampart which means that the Roman gunners must have actually been on a siege tower at least as high as this tree, which would enable the gunners with their spring guns to see over the top of the ramparts, over the heads of the defenders, and shoot directly into chosen targets within the interior of the hill fort. Undoubtedly, it was done with psychological intent because they had weapons which could fire a greater distance than anything that the defenders had. According to the historian Tacitus, hill forts like Hot Hill fell within days. Romans could be brutal in victory. Hod Hill's inhabitants would have been executed or enslaved 
or forced to accept a future as a loyal, tax-paying member of the Empire. Within 30 years of the invasion, the Romans directly controlled the country from Devon in the west to the Humber in the north. The rulers of Yorkshire and Lancashire became client kings like Togidubnus. The peasant farmers who made up most of the British population now found themselves part of a Europe-wide empire. This made a real difference to their lives. People worked for new landowners, as Roman soldiers were granted land in places like Verulamium, just outside modern St Albans. For the first time, what we'd recognise as towns were established. The soldiers employed servants and builders, taverns and brothels opened. Rather than the clan loyalties of Iron Age Britain, these new towns had commerce at their heart. The soldiers made the coins with which they were paid, the common currency of the empire. Britons, who mainly bartered goods, suddenly saw the power of money. The heart and soul of Verulamium was the market, which would have been over there behind the hedge. If you'd walked through it at the end of the first century AD, you'd have been followed by the sound of voices from throughout the empire. Men haggling over everything from Spanish olives to Italian marble to French tableware. The air would have been heavy with the scent of exotic spices and the whole place would have had the atmosphere of an Eastern bazaar. Britons were introduced to new taste sensations. One of them was garum, a sauce made from fermented fish guts. This amphora was labelled Lucius Tetius Africanus, finest fish sauce from Antibes. Producing garum generated such a stench, people were banned from making it at home. A new style of pottery called Samian ware was imported in vast quantities from Europe. Archaeologists have found so much, they believe it rapidly became must-have status symbol in Roman Britain. Romano-British towns boomed. Theatres, civic buildings and fancy townhouses appeared. Not surprisingly, those who embraced this new culture no longer respected the surviving pre-Roman aristocracy. They were losing their land, their power, and they knew their days were numbered. In 60 AD, Verulamium was attacked with unbridled ferocity. So too were the other Romano-British towns of Colchester and London. Thousands were slaughtered and houses burnt to the ground. The historian Dio Cassius says, The attackers hung up naked the noblest and most distinguished women, cut off their breasts and sewed them to their mouths in order to make the victims appear to be eating them. Afterwards, they impaled the women on sharp skewers, run lengthwise through the entire body. And leading the attack was a woman with waist-length hair and piercing eyes. Boudicca. It is possible to imagine the London which Boudicca sacked. It's a small town and it's centred around the modern Bank of England. So if you walk past that building, you can imagine that under your feet is the destruction layer caused by Boudicca's sacking of the city. Found in that layer were these coins, warped by the intense heat created when Boudicca set the city on fire. It's hardly surprising the Victorians cast Boudicca as one of our first national icons. A fearless woman who embodies some kind of pure fighting British spirit. The truth is, Boudicca never saw herself as a British leader. In fact, her husband, chief of the Iceni tribe, was solidly pro-Roman. When he died, he left his kingdom split between the emperor in Rome and his daughters. Perhaps he hoped to maintain some degree of Iceni control. But the procurator, the Roman financial official in Britain, moved in 
perhaps with imperial support, and started taking an inventory of the whole of the palace goods of the Iceni. Boudicca objected, she was whipped, and Tasta says her daughters were raped. And that's the reason that Tastas gives for Boudicca turning on her husband's policies and revolting against the Romans. Boudicca's revolt, though spectacular, was short-lived and unsuccessful. Within weeks of the fall of London, the Romans regrouped, lured Boudicca's army into a field in Warwickshire. They were routed. And Tacitus says the queen killed herself. Of course, the irony is that Boudicca has only endured as an icon of British resistance because Roman authors chose to feature her. And the double irony is that those writers probably inflated her ferocity, turning her into a quasi-mythical Amazonian creature so that the power of the conquering Romans should seem the greater. In reality, Boudicca lost because a number of Britons opposed her. Men and women who found the idea of allegiance to Rome and being a part of the Roman Empire something that was pragmatic and appealing. Boudicca's revolt then is in part a protest against the Romans, but it's also in part straight civil war against other British tribes. If there are Britons fighting against Boudicca for Rome, what do you think those Britons are fighting for? I think they're fighting in recognition of the advantages that the Roman Empire brings them. I mean, those are the advantages of connecting a very small island to a Mediterranean-wide European empire. It means that these kings were now more important in a Roman Empire than they'd ever been as tribal chieftains in Britain. Whether moved by admiration or fear or hard-nosed business sense, there's ample evidence that many Brits, humble and noble, embraced the new order. The towns Boudicca sacked were rapidly rebuilt. This piece of pottery dug up here at Verulamium is one of the bits of evidence that the British had actively engaged in Roman life. It's a piece of Roman Samian ware imported from Gaul, but the name written on it is British. It reads as Sinia or Senia, which was a very common British name. 200 years earlier, this man's tribal ancestors had fought against Caesar's armies. But now the Romano-British had reinvented themselves. They were consumers and entrepreneurs. They'd realized that by becoming part of the Roman Empire, they were buying into a free trade zone that stretched from Britain to Beirut. All over the empire, there's evidence of goods being exported from Britain. A popular export was the woolen duffel coat, known as the Birus Britannicus. British hunting dogs were considered top-notch, as was Cornish tin. But trade went beyond the physical movement of objects. Britain's interest in personal hygiene increased, as shown by this kit consisting of tweezers, ear cleaner and toothpick. At a more sublime level, we find statues of Roman deities in the houses of the locals. Britons, at least the ones getting rich on the new trade, built a novel kind of home. The footprint of one survives in Verulamium. It's completely unlike the kinds of houses Britons had lived in for thousands of years. Iron Age houses, by and large, were circular timber structures with really no partitions inside. There might have been different areas in, in that space that were used for cooking, storage, sleeping and so on, but essentially no privacy between those areas. The very idea of having different rooms for different functions, all with their own access, was in itself uh, a Roman idea. Having one room to eat in, another for sleeping, yet another to cook in, is a concept we can thank the Romans for. But perhaps the most striking and quirkiest example of how deeply Romanisation penetrated the British mind is an archaeological find that now lies under the road, just beyond the house. Here, there was a small tavern and a shop, and between them, something truly astonishing. It was a public convenience that would seat 15 to 20 people. So it means there were hundreds of people in Verulamium who were actually mentally prepared to pay to use a loo. Now that, to me, is something you would never have dreamed of in the pre-Roman world. 
it does suggest that they didn't want any longer to go around the corner and pee against somebody's wall. They perhaps felt civilised enough to do it in a proper place. Under Rome, Britons were taught to want different things from life, including that gruesome ancient entertainment, gladiatorial combat. A pot discovered in Colchester shows several named gladiators fighting each other and wild animals. But of all the things the Romans introduced to Britain, one stands out as dominating every aspect of our lives to this very day. The Romans introduced us to something without which modern life would be unthinkably different. The alphabet we still use today. Pre-Roman Britain was illiterate, and with the Romans came our first experience of the power of the written word. The Romans didn't encourage literacy in Britain out of the goodness of their hearts. For them, writing and documentation were vital tools of control. At its height, the empire embraced around 60 million people, and they were kept in line by men like this. The statue dates from around the beginning of the second century AD and was dug up near the city of London. He's a military clerk. He's armed, as you'd expect, and in his left hand, he's got a case packed full of wooden writing tablets. It's a battered bit of stonework, but it immortalises the secret of Rome's success. To enforce the Pax Romana, the pen was as mighty as the sword. These pens and writing tablets found in London show that the Romans introduced us to the idea of written, legally binding contracts. For illiterate Britons, this was an entirely novel way of establishing who owned what. I think one of the main differences that ordinary Britons would have noticed with the coming of the Romans was that they would have no longer been permitted to carry weapons. Their warrior ethos, the reach for your sword and solve a dispute, was now completely to be abandoned within an urban context. Commercial disputes were not to be solved by fighting, but through Roman courts. So there's a real sense in which something fundamental to the ordinary Britain before the Romans came would have been swept away with this imposition of Roman civil law on British society. But there's surprising evidence, particularly in towns, that Latin didn't just stop street brawls, it became the language of the street. In London, this tile bears an inscription describing one worker's anger at another's laziness. It says, Ostilis has been sloping off on his own every day for a fortnight. Underpinning the spread of Roman culture was her ever-present army. By the end of the first century, there were numerous forts scattered across the country. Britons were recruited too, but thanks to a particularly astute piece of Roman policy, they rarely served within the country. The Romans had a conscious military strategy of jumbling up different racial groups to avoid the potentially explosive or subversive situation where you had locals controlling other locals. For that reason, you might get a boy from here on the Tyneside fighting in the Rhineland. And we know that a group of men were deployed to these barracks called the Tigris Bargemen, a unit that had originated in Iraq. Tens, possibly hundreds of thousands of foreign soldiers and traders settled down here. Many married local girls, making a considerable difference to the British gene pool at a time when the population was just over a million. This tombstone tells such a story. It mourns the death at 30 of an ex-slave girl from Hertfordshire called Regina. It seems she'd been bought by a Syrian flag seller called Barates. The couple then married and moved to the Newcastle area. Then, tragically, Regina died. 
Perhaps marriage to a rich trader was just a way out of slavery for Regina. Or perhaps there's a less cynical explanation. What's certain is that this is an elaborate and expensive piece of work. But I don't think that Barates is just using the tombstone as a way of showing off his material wealth. If you look underneath the figure, there's the Latin inscription that you'd expect, and then down at the bottom, carved into the stone, there's something written in Palmarine, which would have been Barati's native tongue. It reads, Regina Bathheraya Barata Habal. Regina, born of free parents, Barati's, alas. The ambition of a world power had brought together a Syrian flag maker and a slave girl from Hertfordshire. What the evidence seems to suggest is that in this damp, chilly corner of the country, they made a life together and fell in love. On her tombstone, Regina wears a Roman-style dress, but around her neck is a torque, a solid, chunky neck ring, a traditional English tribal ornament. She embodies the remarkable fusion of culture that was Roman Britain. This exquisite shoe belonged to a Dutch officer's wife and was found in a fort near Hadrian's Wall. This bust found in Bath suggests women adopted Roman hairstyles. The Romans encouraged the better off Britons to wear togas and learn Latin. This was a deliberate policy an attempt to improve and ensnare a people the Romans disparagingly referred to as Britunculi, or pathetic little Brits. The Romans made it their business to change our way of life. At the end of the first century AD, the Roman historian Tacitus wrote about the process, implying that there was a hidden agenda. In order to encourage rough men to live in a peaceful and inactive manner, Agricola, who was the governor of Britain, urged them privately and helped them officially to build temples, public squares with public buildings and private houses. Moreover, he had the children of the leading Britons educated in the civilised arts. The result was that those who had once shunned the Latin language now sought fluency and eloquence in it. Roman dress too became popular and the toga was frequently seen. But little by little, there was a slide towards the allurements of degeneracy. Hedonistic assemblies, bathing establishments and smart dinner parties. And then Tacitus delivers his killer blow. It quae apud imperitos humanitas vocabato, cum pars servitutis eset. In their naivety, the Britons called this civilization, when in reality, it was all part of their servitude. The epitome of Romanization was the bathhouse. Several were built near forts and in towns. Men and women both came to the baths, but at separate times. This one has been built exactly to scale, based on these ruins at Chester's Fort near Newcastle. This is the changing room. This is where you'd first come in and this is where you'd greet your friends. You might do some physical exercises, um, but this is where you basically took your clothes off and prepared yourself for bathing. There would be the use of a bath flask like this one, which would be full of oil, usually olive oil, something like that. And when you were in the tepidarium, the warm room, you would pour this onto your skin, rub it in, so it would help you to sweat. And then when you went into the really hot room, the caldarium, and you were sweating, um, you would take a metal strip called a strigil, and you'd use this to scrape the muck and the oil off your skin. You'd then throw yourself into the cold plunge, and you'd use a coarse linen towel like this to dry yourself afterwards. That exfoliation. Absolutely, yes. The author, Seneca, described the hectic atmosphere of the bathhouse. There are groans as muscle men exercise with their weights. The unfit just have massages, and I hear the slap of hands beating bodies. Ball players yell out the score. Drunks have arguments. Thieves shout when they're caught. Some sing out loud. People dive in pools with great splashes, and there are the shouts of those selling drinks and snacks. 
There must have been a problem of infections being passed around in a place like this. Oh, I'm sure so, yes. And this is not running water. This would have to be drained out and refilled on a regular basis. And I don't think they were doing that very often. I'm sure it would have been extremely good for getting thrush, cystitis, all those sorts of things. It's rather a disgusting thought. It is a disgusting thought, and even more disgusting was some evidence we have from the writers of the time where they referred to people using hair-removing creams in a bathhouse and then throwing themselves into the cold plunge. The little green blobs are floating around in there with your, um, with your bathers, which would have been a bit unpleasant, I think. The Emperor Hadrian, who visited England in AD 122, had a different agenda to his predecessors. He wanted to consolidate Rome's territories rather than expand them. He decided pushing north into Scotland was risky and pointless. An empire that covered a fifth of the globe was big enough. To mark the empire's northernmost border, Hadrian ordered the construction of the wall that bears his name. Hadrian's Wall is an astonishing feat. It stretches 73 miles from the Tyne to the Solway. Only an institution with the organisational skills of the Roman Empire could have pulled it off. But though centralised bureaucracies like Rome think big, they also make absurd mistakes. In true Eurocrat style, the officials in Rome laid down strict specifications as to how the wall should look. Every mile, there had to be a fortified gate. But this gate's been built above a sheer cliff face. There's absolutely no chance that anybody could come in or out of it. And what makes it even more absurd is that 30 yards behind me, there is the perfect natural position for an entrance. But it's not precisely one mile from the previous gate. It's an example of Rome at its most ambitious and blindly bureaucratic. Hadrian's Wall was always more symbolic than military. It was rarely used to repel Scottish raiders and was more useful as a way of imposing customs duties on traders. And to some people on the southern side, it was a comforting reminder that the protection of Rome, the great mother city, stretched even this far. Although it's become rather contentious to say that the Romans civilised us, in the strictest sense of the word, that is exactly what they did. Civilization comes from the Latin civis, which means citizen. And in AD 212, the Emperor Caracalla decreed that every free person who lived in the empire was now a Roman citizen. So for that reason, Hadrian's Wall did mark the edge of civilization. Roman Britain was about to enter its golden age. It would last two centuries, but end in chaos. By around 300 AD, the archaeology reflects, for some in Roman Britain, a golden age of prosperity. The remains of many grand villas survive. Some of the finest are here, in the Darrenth Valley in Kent. Some of those villas get an awful lot of money spent on them and they go from being fairly ordinary, unprepossessing buildings to having extended wings, colourful mosaics put on the floor, expensive wall plaster. By the fourth century, the owner of this villa, near the modern village of Lullingston in Kent, extended and enlarged a small farm into a magnificent stone building complete with its own suite of baths. This may have belonged to a rich person, a government official, for example, somebody who was highly placed and could afford to have a country seat and a seat in town. But a villa like this was at the center of an area of highly organized economic activity. We'd see people like cooks and tinkers and peddlers and carpenters and ironmongers and all the people who might have belonged to the sort of slave establishment that would have orientated around a villa like this. Most Britons worked as farmers, but for the first time, the workers and slaves on villa estates grew food not only to feed themselves, 
but also to supply large international markets. Villas like Lullingston were the headquarters of agricultural businesses supplying food to the entire Roman Empire. The historian Libanius described ships full of British corn sailing up the Rhine. All this trade made the owners of villas like Lullingston Roman Britain's nouveau riche, moneyed and pretentious. So whoever owned this place was trying to show he was a cultured, cultivated person. This is part of his credentials, his membership of classical culture, which is quite striking when you think that we're on the edge, virtual edge, of the known world. Economic activity like this created an aspirational middle class. They couldn't afford grand villas like Lullingston, but they certainly aped the lifestyle it represented. It's a little bit like the idea of watching the television and seeing what Victoria Beckham is wearing, for example. Oh, I must have that. Um, but you can't afford that version, so what you'll do is you'll buy the supermarket copycat version of it. This mosaic from a middle-class villa in Yorkshire is truly awful. The tiles are poorly laid out and the artist has no feel for the human form. The person who owned and bought that mosaic is so desperate to belong to this Hello magazine, Roman elite culture, then that's what they've done. So the people living in a place like this with their gold plate and everything else are setting the pace for the rest of the society. And you'll see that all the way through the ages. The elite always set the fashion trends that the rest of the population will try and buy into. But what makes Lullingston Villa a particularly significant British monument is what was discovered in this cellar. It shows that the Romano-British elite didn't just signpost their allegiance by their material tastes. They would change their religion too. The cellar at the villa here doubled up as a household shrine in honour of three water deities. You can just about see on this nymph that she's got reeds growing out of her hair and blue water gushing out from her breasts. As archaeologists excavated the rest of the room, they found that the floor was covered in thousands of fragments of another wall painting. It took them years to piece the jigsaw puzzle together, but as they were finishing, they realised that this wasn't another pagan icon, but something unique in the country. A painting of six Christians with their arms outstretched in prayer. That painting is our evidence of the first known Christian chapel in Britain. There's every likelihood that it's something called a house church. The idea of going to a church, as we understand it, an ecclesiastical building, was not really very well established. Christian communities would meet in rooms and perhaps a travelling priest would come here and the local community would gather and, and, and worship Christ. But of course they, they might have shared it with pagan gods because that whole um, idea we have that you have to be a Christian and nothing else, it was only gradually developing in the Roman world. In the early 4th century, the Emperor Constantine legalised and encouraged Christianity. He saw the new faith as a way of binding together all the far-flung territories of the Empire. But it's unlikely it was ever more than a minority religion in Britain. It was the rich who practised it as a way of declaring their continuing allegiance to Rome. I get the sense, really, that Christianity doesn't sink roots in the Romano-British countryside and in the fourth century it's very much like your party card in a sort of in a, in a 1930s communist country you have your party card and that in a sense indicates that you're part of the government you're part of the elite you're somebody who's politically reliable but the idea that Christianity would hold the empire together was misplaced Faith, however strong, couldn't prevent the barbarian tribes from Germany and Eastern Europe attacking Rome. Britain's island status protected her to some extent, but the ships that carried her lucrative grain exports were now in grave danger. The historian Libanius tells us, Barbarian pirates attack the corn transports. Cargo vessels have been dragged ashore, and many have rotted away. 
The barbarian crisis made it impossible for the emperor in Rome to continue paying the regiments based in Britain. In 410 AD, shipments of coin stopped, and without money, the economy collapsed. When that coin supply stops coming in from the continent, you've got a very, very good indication indeed that the Roman army is either no longer here, it's been withdrawn, or the pay chests are no longer being filled, which must mean that the Roman units that remain here are not being paid and will disintegrate. The places most severely hit by the severance of the monetary umbilical cord to Rome were the towns. Believe it or not, this was once the thriving metropolis of Caliva Atrobatum, about 10 miles outside modern Reading. Instead of these fields, you have to imagine one of the largest settlements in Roman Britain, with a beautiful basilica, an amphitheatre and a buzzing international market. But once it became clear that Caliva Atrobatum could no longer sustain trade with the empire, it was abandoned to become like so many other ghost towns in the country. Unlike places like London and Colchester, this was never resettled. So all that's left are these crumbling walls. What we actually see um, is what's sometimes called by archaeologists squatter occupation, which is quite an evocative term, and it conjures up this idea of um, the poor moving into the crumbling villas and the old townhouses that have been built by the elite, and sometimes they're lighting fires on mosaic floors or they're stalling cattle on a mosaic floor. There are some pretty definite examples of that on some of, the, uh, on some of the villas. So I think by the end of the 4th and once we're into the 5th century AD, we're looking at a Roman civilization that has more or less collapsed. Without the army and an organized government, the cities decayed and the tribal chiefs once again carved up the land. Some have argued that Romanization only really affected the upper classes, but archaeology suggests an extraordinarily busy four centuries. Coins, pottery, tools, inscriptions, art. Roman Britain was a creative and commercial surge we don't see again for centuries. I think the ordinary people living in Britain under Roman rule would also have sensed something of the benefits of that connection between this island and a European empire. They would, for example, have been urbanised, living in cities rather than scattered rural settlements. They would have had a common currency. Many of them perhaps would have picked up the rudiments of Latin and of classical culture. But the real legacy of the Romans was to pacify and unify a set of disparate tribes. Rome established in this island a province, Britannia, and the wall they built would define the two nations that lay either side of it, England and Scotland. Next Saturday, the collapse of the Roman Empire, same time, 8 o'clock. The book Seven Ages of Britain, which accompanies this series, is available in the shops now, price £20. To order yours, call 0870 1234 or click onto channel4.com slash shop. Next up, TV's 100 Greatest Sexy Moments.